Podcast. Welcome to the Almost Perfect Podcast, a celebration of fuck-ups, failures, and falling flat on your face. This is a podcast that believes you can learn from experience, but that experience doesn't have to be your own. Ha, I'm a perfect and I'm a functional fuck-up. Let's learn from somebody else's mistakes. And today we are learning from King Shaft. Uh, King Shaft is a director, producer, and a writer, although we mostly chatted about his directing work uh, on the podcast today because King Shaft directed, well, he was a co director of 1960, which was the opening film at Diff, and I think it won the award for Best South African Picture. Uh, Best South African feature film at uh, the Durban International Film Festival. So yeah, we chat about that. We chat about Scheme Psalm and Uzalo as uh, King Shaft also directed those. And uh, yeah, we get into some of the difficulties with budgets and all of that, you know, and how the, the many years of experience helped bring 1960 to your screens. So that's coming up in just a little bit. Of course, I need to let you know that this podcast is brought to you by you which means you can support it by going to patreon.com forward slash almost perfect or just go to almostperfect.co.za. Without further ado, here comes the Almost Perfect Podcast with King Shaft. How are you living, King Shaft? I uh, know, man, life is good, yeah. <laughs> I'm in Devon, outside I can see the ocean. I mean, sometimes it's the simple things in life that really makes a difference. I'm good. I'm happy. Yeah, you must have woken up feeling pretty proud of yourself today, opening, you know, the film festival last night with your film 1960. Yeah, I, I am actually. I'm thrilled because there has been some, a lot of projects that I've done that have never seen the light of day, either because of finance or because of other issues. So when this film eventually, when we set out to do this film, it was meant to be a pilot project. Oh, I heard you guys mention that last night. So what, was it going to be a TV show? Yeah, we we're going to pitch it as a TV series. Okay. So the, the approach also was that we're just going to put our efforts together and push that passion and make something that we can sell. And then after a while, uh, struggling to just meet and sell this thing to uh, streaming services, we just decided, let's just make it a film. Then we made a film. So to be, for the film to be noticed and picked up to a point where they feel out of all the entries it was worth to open the film festival, yeah, that was like a, a vote of confidence to say uh, throughout all these years it's not all in vain, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. and you have been in the game for like nearly 20 years now? Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> but that is a testament to, you know, the long, the the years that you've put into the industry and that. Yeah. And also with this project, it did seem like it very much was a passion project that yeah. you guys had quite a few difficulties with, as I understand, because of the pandemic. Yeah, we did a lot, a lot of difficulties, even long before the pandemic. Because like we did say that it was almost like just a few people that are into this and pour their hearts out and let's shoot this thing. The first leg of shooting was in Cape Town 2018. And I remember we, hence I said, we didn't have a start of time or a cut of time. We shot like it was a film project where you shoot until the night. Sometimes <laughs> you wrap at 12, sometimes at 1 a.m., then you back again, you know? So it was, that on its own was challenging that you don't even know when you're gonna. It's almost like when everyone feels. So that's yawning and full tired. Then, then you like know it's red. done. <laughs> Unless yeah. you need to get a tired seat, and then that's perfect. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, so there was that, and then the, the, it was just difficult shooting it. You know, films need money. And that's money unfortunate brings, reality. Yeah, yeah brings, brings the, 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 the what, what you could say, uh, convenience. Yep. And, and everything becomes smooth, and it doesn't feel like it's a... It's hard work, but if you don't have that, then you, you have to make a lot of compromises and adjusting. What's that like, though, when you see the finished product then? Do you feel like some type of way where you're like, oh, that could have been a little better? Or do you just go, you know what, we did the best we could with what we had? Yeah, no, obviously, you, you always feel like you could have done better, you know? <laughs> However, I think I'm proud. I'm actually proud in the sense that 
most of the time we were stuck and concerned with you watching it from that point of view of editing it to say yeah let's make this let's make that so it was the first time watching it with the with normal people <laughs> yeah and, yeah and not having to worry about the edit anymore because yeah, it's done they, it's they, there they, don't care. they want the story it's done it's there you know you can't want to justify why you couldn't do this or how you could have done this better and so the the yeah i was excited i think uh, uh I've also watched it for the first time in 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 with that eye that like an audience you know yeah. all along I've been watching it as critical you know as a, the make as the creator yeah yeah so a few people came to me and they were really 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 impressed and they were like if there's one film we could take money and pay it's this one that's amazing yeah and and I was like maybe as artists we we tend to get lost in our own thought Hey so I fucked up. Um the batteries died midway through that sentence and I checked the batteries beforehand. They said 3 when they went in, but I think they're old and yeah, they just died super quickly and I wasn't able to edit things to make it sound cohesive, so I figured I would just let you know. Hey, I fucked up. Anyway, back to the podcast. So, yeah, we were talking about some of the challenges that you were facing mm. with the film, but then also seeing it uh, with fresh eyes. Like you were seeing it as, mm. you know, now it's done. It's up there and everyone's watching and then people were saying that they wanted to, you know, actually pay to see this film and you were seeing the value of the story. So, mm. want to pick up from there? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, ma- making the film was challenging in itself in a sense that it was a uh, almost no budget. So then it makes things it down scales things in yeah. terms of skills of crew manpower just just convenience of things of how a normal professional asset would run so which means it needed us to dig deeper and you know forget about other certain things you know but look certain things like I did say it last night that the catering was terrible <laughs> 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 But you know we stuck it out. So that was kind of like a film school yeah, like yeah, kind of vibe. Like, I felt like I was back at the film school where you shoot and you don't know when you're going to rap. <laughs> <laughs> you just get as much as you can yeah, in a yeah. day until someone starts yawning. We don't we don't rap. <laughs> so the adrenaline was nice. The challenging was a challenge in itself was good. The weather was a challenge. Cape Town hey, especially Cape Town, weather, yeah. Yeah. And uh, even when we, where we were living was far off from set you know we had to drive because uh, fortunately we shot at the Cape Town Film Studios and okay. yeah but yeah all of that and then i know for the second leg was during the pandemic so it wasn't easy to move and get things done you know yeah. so yeah and 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 even making the film itself because we had to work with music yes so and and actually get the actors to get the words right To, to make it feel like it's them singing you know yeah yeah cuz was, was yeah. I was actually wondering Lindy well, the the actress who plays Lindy she no. must actually sing no like, she no. doesn't no it wasn't her oh, she did well well no I'm saying that she sings in the film but in oh, yeah. in real life cuz the way she acted when she was singing was yeah. like that looks like someone singing it so does. everyone thought it was her actually <laughs> <laughs> she had to clarify that I can't even strike a note wow well, she's good at that she yeah. um Oh yeah, so one of the things I wanted to know was why did you guys care so much about the story? Why did you like, you know, do this thing on a shoestring budget and really work f- so hard to make it happen? Mm. I think first thing first is when uh, when I met up with Bruce and Mike. Bruce believes in the story so much and Mr. Kaya who is the kind of circle in the yeah. Film, yeah. They believed in it so much. So at times it's not I think it's just about when you see someone believe in something so much you have no choice but to actually take it from that same point of view and then secondly what attracted me to the story was the fact that as much as was about the fact that it's a story about dreams staying alive despite being in a certain environment you know yeah and and we 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 kind of like felt like and the third thing was the fact that the music itself knowing Bruce is a brilliant music scorer but also we wanted to capture the world of Shabville the story of maybe the untold story of Shabville and use music 
as a vehicle to tackle even issues that were affecting people at that time. So we wanted to also just say, this is a story about a dream that seeks to stay alive despite the 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 the, the times of and and, and, of, and, and the and the, the circumstances the turmoil yeah, and the circumstances at that time so that's really for me was what about when it's just tell a musical story yeah how much was lindy like based on maria makeba because like i like kind of saw like you know with the going into yeah. exile going overseas yeah. becoming famous and stuff like that's seemed a lot like you know maria makeba's story and also obviously the sophia yeah. town and yeah. stuff like that no yeah she maria makeba was a big uh, character archetype for us for okay. Lindy. yeah we we drew some inspiration from that and also because during those times there were only a few that were were, were exemplar in that state sure. yeah you would say maria makeba and you name a few that actually were also in a similar journey where they come from a, a place of turmoil and make it through overseas and then all of that you know so yeah definitely she was an inspiration for the lindy curry and yeah. then i guess a part of this film was also just like highlighting the human aspects of these times yeah because you don't really show the violence you don't really show like you know it happens and it's mm. happening around like yeah. the characters and that but it's not yeah. the focal point of the film whereas a lot of films set in that time yeah. you know the violence is a big part of it and like yeah. so was that a conscious choice or was that because of budget <laughs> yeah it was it was because also there were many uh, i think uh, aspects that also drove us to that point one could be the fact that we knew that you know when you have to do violence you need a budget <laughs> yeah otherwise it's going to look cheesy you know yeah. so we didn't have the budget to actually get amras and all of that but secondly we also said to ourselves uh for once let's make a film that there isn't really a spectacle yeah it's just pure simple emotions you know and it's a, a challenging thing to do simple films like that where you don't focus on the other stuff and you just tell a journey an emotional story of someone so we we wanted to also say let it not be the focus and then just just focus on the journey of our character Lindy and how she maneuvers her way through the times to get to where she's supposed to go yeah, yeah. And then how much of like your own life did you put into the film in terms of like keeping dreams alive and that sort oh. of thing yeah well uh, I, I, i did i i guess The first thing you do when you have to do a project is find the what how how you can live through the story. How does it resonate to you? So when I approach a, a project, I I don't first approach it like I'm a filmmaker or whatever. I first say to myself, as just a normal person, what are my needs? What is this film seeking to address? And how can I play a role in society to address that? So it must first appeal to me emotionally before i can tackle it as a filmmaker you know what i'm saying because at the end of the day before we are filmmakers or artists we are people yeah. and we're an audience so we know what we want to watch we know what we want to consume and if it doesn't resonate with us then it's not going to resonate you know well yeah yeah so i i also said here's a here's a project that's different to let's say other projects where we we go action or deep in art or whatever this is just an emotional piece how can we make this work so that we can actually resonate with the audience so yeah the film actually kept my i i could see i could understand what it means to keep a dream alive so i i understand the journeys and that one needs to go through in order to see their dreams alive so i could live and find myself through the form you know i understood lindy's journey and uh, yeah so i it was easy for me to connect and use that because also as much as we're telling a period piece we also still need It's to universal. make it relevant yeah to here to now to anywhere in the world everyone has a dream to achieve and everyone comes from a certain background and everyone has to find them <laughs> their own identity you know yeah yeah definitely um tell me a bit like yeah about 
your career, you know, like how yeah. did you get into film? I know you studied it after and that, yeah. but what's, what drew you to it? Oh, it all started back home. I grew up in a village in Pumalang called Bush Park Ridge. Okay. So how I, I got into storytelling initially was that my grandfather was a very spiritual man, so he used to make me read the Bible for him. Okay. And then after that, he would one ask me to interpret what that verse meant. Okay. And if I don't know it, they will say, go figure it out and tell me. And also, because at that time, TV is not very big in the village, you know, so sure. they still have that old campfire where they tell stories, you know, uh, with the hope that they will pass on knowledge from one generation to the other. So that also, that old campfire storytelling kind of stayed with me, you know, until I moved to Joburg. When and, was that? Um, Huh? When was that? <laughs> hey, Joe Beck, I think I moved there early 2000. Okay, but how old were you? Uh, no, I just finished my trick. I don't remember. Maybe 18, 19, or 20, somewhere there. Okay. But what happened was also, uh, I used to do music. Oh, cool. So my moving to Joe Beck was to pursue music until I met, because I was staying in Soweto at that time, like with relatives or family house in Dobsonville. And then I, I went to the library and there was, a, there was a drama school and a music school there. And they told me the music person left. It's only drama. <laughs> then I joined. I was like, oh, instead of sitting at home, let me join. It was before film school. So I joined the drama school and that's where I started theatre and, and then became an actor. So it started like that until one time I was an extra in a film that after I was doing. And then I knew about the... That's how I discovered, oh, there's a film school. Then I applied, then I studied it out. So I was exposed. I'm fortunate that I also started as an extra and as a runner while I was studying. So I, I got So you were both, a lot? Yeah, I got best of both worlds, you know? So that's where it, it all started. After that, I kind of knew from film school that this is what I want to do. But I also knew it was going to be a long journey to get to, but I was prepared to... Yeah. I mean, especially because at that time, like, the South African film industry was nothing like it is today. And even today, it's not like, you know, anything like overseas kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. like, what were you thinking about back then? Were you wanting to go overseas or were you... <laughs> yeah, it's natural, you know, when yeah. you feel like uh, locally they're not ready for film, to embrace film as a culture. You know, it's just TV, TV, TV. Yeah. I think... Because also when you travel and you go to different film festivals, you realize how the world embraces film and they take it too serious, you know. They respect it as a craft and they invest in it and all of that. Whereas here, they still see it like it's just pure entertainment. They don't yeah. take it serious, you know. It's like someone could even say, why don't you go get a proper job? <laughs> Because this thing of art, it's not happening, you know. I think every artist in this country has heard that. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, so that, that's how I think uh, at that time, yeah, I did have ambitions of just moving overseas and where film can be, or as an artist, you can be welcome and do things, you know. Yeah, however, you know, we stuck it out <laughs> until it works. You, so what was your career path from there? You got straight into TV or? Yeah, yeah I got straight into TV. I think I was fairly talented at that time. <laughs> And uh, I was fortunate that while I was doing second year, I was already shooting music videos. Oh, cool. And then when I went to third year... Anything I would know? Uh, it's a lot. The late Double HP. Oh, wow. Late Mendoza. Okay, okay. So, yeah, stuff, yeah. I, stuff I would have seen on SBC <laughs> yeah, One? Yeah, yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah, and then, and then also, I, I third year I got a film for to direct for Mnet New Directions. Oh, it's like that was a good project that they used to do. Yeah. Okay. So and 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 then it won an award. So it was just like everything is almost like. So it seems like everything just happened naturally for yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. So I and then I got after that. Then when I graduated, I just got my first uh, TV directing gig for a thirteen part. Okay. That time was called Charge, straight from school. No experience whatsoever, but... I mean, that's one way to get experience. <laughs> yeah, so I was fortunate in that way. And then how did you come to work with, like, Scheme Sam? Oh, uh, yeah, as I started working over time, and then I was approached, I think, by 
maybe certain people liked my work. And then they decided, no, let's let's engage in it would it would be, you know. So they think you had like some edge? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I think uh, what I like I would like to believe that over time as an artist you need to find a voice and a style. Sometimes you become aware of it first, sometimes people become aware of it first. So maybe you have the flavor that they want, you know? Yeah. Yeah, because everyone is always looking for something new and fresh. So uh, I think I had that new style. I've always strived to do something different all the time. I was going to say, how do you keep things new and fresh then this long into your career? Because I think that I don't take it for granted. Okay. Each time I approach a project, I approach it like it's the first time. I still have the the jitteries, I still have the anxiety <laughs> because the moment you stop, you the moment you lose that hunger, then it's the end of it, you know. So I, I maintain that hunger and humility and I think I take time before I engage in a project to find its spirit, to say, okay. yes, we're telling a story, but what what is what is the energy, what is the spirit of what we're trying to sell, you know? So that at the end of the day, that's what people take out when they, they leave out of a project. Uh, yes, the images, but more it's the emotions, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so I try to do that with each project so that I give it a spirit, so that even if someone try and copy it, they can't copy the... That, that spirit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah. And then with Scheme Sam and that, did you find that that's elevated your career quite a bit or were you already like quite a name? No, it did, it did. Because then I was able to uh, get through different places through it. Yeah, because I'm sure it did well. Like. Yeah. <laughs> and also, I think the more you... Because film is also a practical art. Yeah. The more you do, the more you learn, the more you master your craft. So, and the more you you understand the whole industry and how things work, you know? Yeah. It takes time to actually get to a place where you understand that the cin- the language of cinema. So, Skim Sam also awarded me the opportunity to to just create, you know, and do. Yes, it's TV. Yes, you have to deliver in time. Yes, there's a template. But the opportunity you get, as little as it may be, you try and create something artistic, you know? But that's the thing, Scheme Sum was artistic. Like, it, yeah. it's a show that, yeah, it resonated with a lot of people and actually, yeah. like, dealt with real issues in South Africa. Like, yeah. so, yeah, that's why like, I just wanted to yeah. bring it up with you. And then with Uzalo, how did that all come about? Was that just because, you know, once again, years in the industry, now your name is known, like, and people are like, yeah, we bo- need to both get... Both ways, King. both ways. And the fact that also... <laughs> New people that knew, and then they would say, you will come. But it was also the style, because yeah. everyone, they were looking, it's a new show. And they, I think one of my strong points that I've noticed over the years is that I know how to connect with the audience somehow. And I think they, they were looking for that. They were looking to, to bump the show to a point where it can land and resonate with the people, you know? Yeah, and for me, one of my most... Or one, one thing about my style or my voice as a filmmaker, I like using nostalgia. I, I kind of noticed. <laughs> yeah, because I create images and situations that everyone can can kind of relate to. You know, like things like when you're a kid and you open a fridge and you're trying to drink a condensed milk, things like those, you know. Uh, so once you have those images, you've already won an audience over because they know they can easily place themselves in that situation. So I think with Uzalo was the same. It was the fact that they needed the show to connect with the people. Which it did. It resonated heavily. Like, I know lots of people who love Uzalo. Like. Yeah, you know, so <laughs> that's how the whole thing came about. And it was great working there as well. Because uh, that was uh, here in KZN. Yeah? That was here in KZN. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy that I was part of just setting up an industry here. Yeah. yeah. So it was a good experience. I mean, that's the thing. It must feel pretty good to be part of like two really iconic shows like in South African TV history. I mean, most directors don't even get one. So like... Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is actually. It's just... That's what I'm saying. Yesterday's screening just was made a lot of sense. Yeah, that all this time that 
the masses was going left, you're going right. <laughs> and then eventually you meet up on the path yeah. together, like... Yeah, yeah, it paid off big time, I won't lie to you, you know, because like I said, there were a lot of projects that I shot that never really saw the light of day. You want to talk a little bit about that? Like, what's that like? How does that feel? Because like, I can imagine it must be pretty disheartening. It is, it is, I won't lie to you. Because even ourselves with Mike, there was one film we shot in East London. Okay. 360. Beautiful project. It also didn't see the light of day because of finance and all of that. People charging money. <laughs> then 2018, I shot, before I shot this movie, actually, I shot a drama series here in KZN in a show called, it was called Uselo, which was a band, was a period piece based okay. in 1800. Beautiful. It was the project. Oh, you must have that, loved that. <laughs> yeah, because it was the project where I was going to show the people my signature in full. You know when you work on projects, there's glimpses then there. Yeah, but that all one, flourishes. I finally had a pro, something that I can say, this is my style, you know. And then, then things happened and it feels like someone just pulled the rug underneath your feet, you know. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. I've been a part of some projects some way smaller than that yeah. that have had some of those issues. Yeah. Just quickly looking for the Patreon questions because I've got a Patreon account and people ask oh. guest questions from there. So we got one person who asks, if you started your own TV channel, what would it be about? This is by Simp Slayer. <laughs> Nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be about playing content that says the things that are unsaid. Okay. Yeah. I think there's a lot of content of films and stories that we have not even begun scratching the surface. And until we start doing that, like, we haven't done anything. Because the world is expecting a lot from us, but we're not just delivering. We, we just but it's also, don't you think the world expects like a certain type of thing from South African directors, you know, like struggle films that are like you know, just a bit more cliche. Like, that's what I liked about 1960 was that like, it didn't focus yeah. on, like, the cliches of the genre, you know? Yeah. Well, we have to break away. Until we give them something else, they'll always expect some, another thing from us. We can't. Like it's like how rom, rom comes. There's plenty of love stories in this country, but it doesn't have to feel like an American rom-com, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, it's, it's almost like as filmmakers, we have to unlearn what we've learned and become normal people again and tell stories from that point of view. I think that's like been your biggest thing that you've been saying here is yeah. just that they bring the humanity back to stories. Definitely. And I'll tell you, our stories are going to just go, you know? Yeah, I believe but, that. Yeah, but most of the time we tell, we sell our people an American vision of a story, you know? Yeah, it's in the translation than the story itself. Yeah. No, I agree 100% there. Yeah, yeah. And then the last question I'm going to ask you is a question I ask everyone on the podcast yeah, is, yeah. what is a big mistake that you learned an important lesson from? Sure. You can focus on the lesson. Like, you don't have to be like, ah, fucked up with this manager way. You can just be like, I learned this because I did this. <laughs> I learned, <clears throat> I think I learned what I learned. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot of lessons, but I think one that I've learned is that when you are given a mission to to do, you need to complete it, irrespective of the times, the conditions. So I learned to be more like water. You know, water it's like very something zen. that you can't capture. It changes form. Sometimes it evaporates. Sometimes it flows. Sometimes it's solid like ice, but it's still water. So I learned to be adaptable, to become the characters in my movie. Sometimes you become the hero. Sometimes you become the villain, sometimes you, you know. But the, the, the mission is to get the, the, the story across. So I, I maneuver now. I don't take things personal in a way like I used to. Before, before I used to just be that artist. Exactly. It's this way of knowing, you know. <laughs> hey, yeah. artists like get in their own way sometimes with the sensitivity. Yeah. But I, I know for myself, I've made mistakes like that where yeah. like I get touched and take things too personally where like you're saying, you just got to get the job done. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's what it's about. I mean, there was one, I remember there was a time I lost an account with my partners then, which was worth, I think, four million. 
at that time. But it was that thing of saying, you guys are young, you can't run the finance, you'll be, create, create, you'll be creative, head of, head of creative, this company will handle finance. I'm like, no way, what the hell? <laughs> you, you guys were looking for a new company we pitch, so we went that, you know what I mean? Yeah. But then, looking back now, I'm like, it was it were all lessons, you know, that sometimes it's not about the entire cake, even if you get a piece, it's enough. Next time you get a bigger, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, the whole cake's going to make you sick anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, that's that. Thank you very much. This Thank has been you, such a cool chat. And yeah, I'm looking forward to people seeing 1960 once yeah. it's in theaters properly. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. I, I'm excited, brother. It's a, you don't understand. <laughs> I don't. Like, I wish, I, like, I hope to one day be in your situation. Yeah, it's a, it's a good feeling to finally... It's not easy to make films and to get films actually complete. Yeah, and, especially and here. And be out there, you know? So for us, just to be in that, to watch it on screen like that, ish, it just shows that the things that we take for granted and do every day, it's not just for every day. We, no one knows how it's going to turn out at the end. So for that, it has opened my eyes to a point where last night, I actually, when I got home, I, I completed a script that I've been, <laughs> so I'm going to shoot shoot it myself. And next year, I can promise that hopefully my film will be picked up again. Nice. The, the first well, time. hopefully you'll be here at, or, you know, go, go down to DFM and try to sell it like later today. <laughs> I, I will, actually. I'm going to do that. Yeah. 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 Well, I might see you down there. Cool. Definitely. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks, brother. So that was King Shaft. Yeah, man, a bit of a short one there because we had the Bunny Sitebe interview like just afterwards. And yeah, it was a bit of a crazy day that was on the Friday after the opening night at Duff. But yeah, I was really stoked to get to chat to him, got to learn a lot more about his career. And uh, yeah, I hope you learned a little bit from that. I've got some news for you. I've got my license. I know some of you would be like, shouldn't you already have your license, Bob? You're a 35 year old man. It's like, well, yeah, I should, but I didn't up until this Tuesday where, yeah, I went for my driving test and I passed that shit, mostly with flying colors, like the <laughs> the parking stuff. I think I lost some points on not doing observations like the one time I lost like 10 points there. And then, yeah, the driving was super chilled, like because I've had two cars and <laughs> been able to drive since I was a teen. So I was stressed out just because like I didn't want to have to go through the fucking like booking process again. That whole thing is such a fucking nightmare, man. It's really you're know, just dealing with uh, governmental departments in South Africa and the bureaucracy is something that like all South Africans I think feel the pain of. Like whether you gotta go to home affairs, whether you gotta go to the licensing department, that is like just you've got a fucking going mentally prepared to just have a fucking mind-numbingly boring day and yeah just uh get that fucking admin done like i guess that's the that's the thing it's like personally it took me this long because you know i had my cars and when i had cars that's when i was trying to get my license and shit and i failed in my early 20s and then after that I got my learners and then I got another car and then I was going to do my license but then I forgot to put water <laughs> in the uh yeah forgot to put water in the car and it blew the head gasket which uh yeah <laughs> cost pretty much half the amount that I paid for the car so I just scrapped it got the money I could out of it and I think that's when I got my scooter or maybe I had my scooter before I, was, I can't remember all of that so I've had different modes of transport but then Uber and Bolt and stuff became a thing. I, you know, just didn't have the finances. Like, you know, that car cost me 20K, which had taken me a while to save up. And yeah, I mean, it was a Tata Indy car. <laughs> and uh, no, it's not a great car or anything, but it got me where I needed to go. And then after that, yeah, I didn't have that car. So I was like, fuck it. Lost the license thing. No need to carry on with that. There's going to be self-driving cars in five years time. So I'm not going to need that. And uh, yeah, it turns out that timeline might be a little bit longer. So 
I decided just to hedge my bets a little bit and get into the land of the licensed. Also because, yeah, I'm starting to save again for another car. Maybe a Bucky. That's actually kind of the idea because of equipment for events and then also just camping and things like that because I want to travel the country a little bit. So I've got a plan in my mind, an idea for like a long road trip and stuff and getting my license was the first step to being able to do that properly whether i even just hire a car and you know go around the country for like a month or something we'll see we'll see how it all comes along but uh yeah step one accomplished and uh, yeah if you've been putting it off i suggest you just go and get it done it is a fucking schlep it is a nightmare it sucks it's stressful it's just an all-around shitty fucking experience but it is a rite of passage i guess and i'm glad like yeah i've got it done finally own race own pace and all of that but i figure once you're 35 you either have your license or you don't and i have my license so <laughs> yeah man that's rad then what else is rad yeah i've been working more and more on the point waterfront arts festival we've got some sick fucking shows lined up for you we've got some amazing venues I think, yeah, just go find Point Waterfront Arts Festival on Facebook and on Instagram and you'll see some of the uh, details coming out over the next few days. Like, I think we announced the breakfast room today, which is like a 666 spot uh, down by Mahatma Gandhi Road, aka Point Road. Uh, it's uh, got the lovely little cafe in the front, but then at the back is like more of an event space. It's been various different things like it used to be chow bella and i've done like sick events there like i remember we had gateway drugs play there once and uh yeah that was a fucking rad night <laughs> well it was a rad night for everyone else like i i did all right you know i had a good time but <laughs> you don't always have a good time you don't have the best time when you're the one putting on the event so that's uh, a gift you give to other people and other people had a fucking sick time i've also seen like a lot of dope acts i saw ricky rick there man um so yeah really cool venue really cool space and we're going to be doing some comedy gigs there there's going to be art there's going to be various different things that you can check out so look out for that on social media and then yeah we're going to be doing stuff at the chairman we're going to be doing stuff at robson's brewery and we're also going to be doing stuff at the bond shed so a lot of fucking cool shit happening for the Point Waterfront Arts Festival. I'm just booking and helping book the comedy stuff and then comedy and music night that's going to be coming together alongside the music Umbizo. So more details coming out on social media and I'll probably be able to tell you who's coming through next week. If you look at some of the guests of this podcast, you might be able to take a, take a few guesses as to who is coming along, although... Uh, there are definitely some people coming through that haven't been on the podcast or one person was on an almost live they weren't on the podcast and another person hasn't been on the podcast the others have all been on and uh, yeah we'll also obviously have some Durban acts on the bill so yeah busy sorting all of that out busy putting together the lineups and that and then yeah a lot of solo shows um yeah I feel like probably repeated a bunch of stuff there and uh that's enough of that. What else? I'm coming to Joburg. I'm going to Joburg tomorrow. I am going to be flying up. I'm obviously going to see my gran and my mom and spend a week with them. But I'm also trying to get an interview with someone up there. And I'm also going to be performing at the Hooker Lounge in Benoni, I think. It's either Benoni or Boxburg. It's somewhere in the east there. I'll share the poster on social media, which should be later today. Uh, when I get that from Eric Janssen. I think it's a free gig. It's a weekly gig that happens every Thursday at the Hooker Lounge. Either in Boxburg or Bononi. I can't remember the details <laughs> exactly right now. But like I say, I will put that out there for you. And I'm stoked. I get to do like a headline set. And I get to try out some new material uh, in, in between. You know, like we'll, we'll start strong. We'll end strong. And in the middle, we'll we'll see what we can do with some new material. So if you want to hear what I've been cooking up uh, in the lab with a pen and a pad, then come on through to that. That's on Thursday, the, the 11th of August. And yeah, like I say, I will put the full details out on social media so you can know about that 
And one last development in my life, you know, since you asked so nicely, is uh, I'm going to be writing stuff again for money because uh, I'm going to be doing some freelance stuff with Letterhead, which is a company headed up by Kaylee Bright and uh, Patrick Fisser. I think I've done events with Patrick or an event with Patrick and Johnny years ago at the Winston. And then I've written for Kaylee back in the day as well, I think, for Spree. If, yeah, I did the Kind Cruise article for her and known her for ages. And yeah, we met up last week, uh, had a lunch and decided to work together. So I'm going to be putting out some work about Durban and various other things. And the first article I'm going to be writing is about sneaker culture in wrestling. And uh, yeah, you can look out for that on the Shelf Life website at some point. So yeah, it looks like I'm steadily getting back into the game, getting back into my real life with uh, a lot more tools at my disposal and a lot more certainty about myself. I'm no longer, <laughs> you know, like the pandemic definitely took a fuckload away from me. It definitely hit things very hard and i struggled through it but i learned tools and those tools have i think helped me <laughs> you know just become a better person and become more more than myself i want to be and i feel like i can start being creative and finding projects and things that i want to be a part of again you know so yeah you'll see some of that stuff coming out with that all out the way, it is now time for the shout out. Every single week on this podcast, we give shout outs to the titular titles tier over patreon.com. So the top tier is a $10 tier. And uh, you can think of other T's that you want to throw in there, like Mr. T or whatever, uh, for some alliteration. But yeah, basically, it is the highest tier of your Patreon, because in South Africa, I know people aren't going to be able to drop a 20 a month. Maybe some people, maybe, but... Uh, Actually, maybe I'm shooting myself in the foot by not having a $20 level. But I feel like I, I don't want to, you know, like extort money out of you. And again, it is your choice as to when let you give me money. Hmm. I'll take it under advisement. Uh, anyway, the $10 tier is the top tier. And uh, you get to pick your title right here on the Almost Perfect Podcast. And I shout you out at the end of every episode. So shout outs to Karan Chetty, the assistant to the regional manager. Shout out to Kath Jenkins, the inevitable ruler of the universe, and Queen Swifty. Also, I'm going to be working on a super secret project with Catherine that uh, you'll find out about pretty soon. So check out her, uh, <laughs> her social media accounts for that. Uh, shout out to Julian, who is the king. Shout out to Riz Ventura, our director of purchasing. Shout out to Stephen Olafia, the executive producer. Shout out to Karan Slemon, our almost perfect hedge fund manager. Shout out to Vishendra Naidu, the spiritual advisor. Shout out to Neil Green, a key group. And also shout out to Neil Green for a check he's doing comedy out in Ireland, which means we're going to be getting him back on the podcast soon enough and hear how life has uh, been treating him over there. Shout outs to Russell Grant, our Far East correspondent. And shout outs to Rousseau, the storage clerk of subtle heresies in the lesser Overberg region. Shout outs to Damien Roots, who's not a patron, uh, but he is the guy who put together the bed music you hear underneath you that's making me sound oh so smooth and uh, that dope as fuck intro music that you hear each and every single week and lastly shout outs to you i'll catch you on the flip side <laughs>